Um, so I'm Joe Truesdell, and my husband, who's in one of these boxes, uh, is uh, manning the uh, manning the waiting room. Uh, but we're owners of Typo Bookshop in Worcester, which we uh, had hoped to open in March, and that of course couldn't happen. But I think 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 we're going to be able to uh, uh, start curbside uh, pickup this weekend, which we're really excited about, and we're certainly hoping to open in some fashion uh, fashion or rather uh, before too long. But for now, um, we're zooming from home just the way uh, the way you guys are, except for Ingrid, who happens to be zooming from New Zealand. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> so the story of uh, of Schofield Fair uh, begins in Worcester and it ends in Worcester. So it's very fitting that uh, the story is being told right here in Worcester, and we're really excited to have Caroline and Jim here to uh, to tell it. Um, my siblings and I, and I see my cousins are here also. So, and we we grew up hearing about um, Thayer's Dial Collection, which was uh, housed here at the Worcester Art Museum for, I guess, like 50 years or so. Uh, our Aunt Louisa Dresser was a curator at the museum for a good portion of that time. They were kind of there at the same time. And certainly in, in 1982, it was a surprise to many in Worcester, but not 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 to everyone in Worcester, uh, that the collection was not going to be staying in Thayer's hometown any longer. So that was a sad day indeed for, uh, for Worcester. So Caroline Kamujis, born in Worcester, but now based in New York, is a co-founder and managing director of Delphi Partners, a philanthropic consultancy, and she's also a producer of independent films and is presently working on Strokes of Genius, Schofield Thayer, The Man Who Made America Modern. Um, originally from England, Jim Dempsey, an award-winning journalist, found his way to Worcester, of course, because all roads lead to Worcester, obviously. <laughs> and he's now teaching and writing, uh, uh, teaching writing and literature at WPI. So Jim is a consulting producer on Caroline's film. And among other books, he's the author of The Tortured Life of Schofield Fair, a book that I almost finished in time for tonight and which I highly recommend and it just so happens that we're getting a shipment of, of his books into uh, the bookstore um, very I think it's coming momentarily actually and um, and so uh, they will be uh, available at, at Tidepool uh, bookshop so we'll send information out to you tomorrow about that. But before we begin, I just want to let you know that we are recording the program. Uh, I probably should have let you know that um, uh, when we wrote to you, just in case. Um, I put on earrings for the, oh, one of them's come off. Oh, well, whatever. Um, but, uh, so uh, we want to have the, the uh, program available um, uh, on our website. And also, if you have any questions, questions uh, during the talk, there's a little chat button at the bottom of your screen. And Ingrid Mock uh, has graciously agreed to man the chat. I guess actually she'll be uh, womaning the chat. And um, so she will relay your questions to uh, Caroline and Jim during a, a Q&A at the end, sort of a 10, 10 minute whatever Q&A at the end. Um, hopefully there'll be time for everyone's questions to be answered. If I shut up, maybe there will be time. You never know. But the one more thing. So if you haven't already muted yourself, now um, would probably, now that I'm going to stop talking, now would be a great time uh, to do that in case somebody comes along and vacuums your, mm -hmm. your rug or something. I know vacuum has been on in our house for months, but anyway, but maybe in your house is people vacuum, you vacuum. Um, anyway, Caroline, welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Oh, you're welcome. So I am going to hope that this will work. I'm trying to do screen share, everybody. Excellent. Um, so let's see. All right. So is, does everybody see a slide that says Schofield Fair, the man who made America? Yes, we have that. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, as, as Joe and Huck said, we did practice um, syncing this <laughs> all up, but as great as technology is, we, you know, there are always pitfalls as well. So first of all, of course, thank you, Joe and Huck. And 
one thing that um, actually Joe neglected to mention, she, she talked about her Aunt Louisa Dresser. Louisa Dresser was curator at the Worcester Art Museum and she curated what has now become the definitive dial collection art show, if you will, in 1959. And I will talk more about that a little later, but it was an extraordinary show and she managed to bring together a lot of people who were involved with the magazine, such as E.E. Cummings, <coughs> Henry McBride, et cetera. Anyway, uh, and a salute to Joe and Huck for being pioneers like Thayer and starting a new enterprise of, you know, a new bookstore in Worcester. It's very exciting for all of us. Okay, and a <coughs> thanks to everybody for Zooming in. I know that people's dance cards are getting pretty crowded with all these Zoom, Zoom calls. So I appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. Is everything okay? Okay. We can hear? Okay, so Jim and I are going to talk about one of the most extraordinary and yet unknown, um, uh, I would say, men of letters, modern arts and letters in the U.S. So the video clip would have given you an introduction, so I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of the introduction. There, as we've mentioned, was a, was a Worcester native and a very troubled genius. He was an eccentric patron of the arts, but what he's best well known for is being the visionary editor of a magazine called The Dial. It was an arts and literary magazine in the 20s. Yes. And what he did was introduce writers and artists who are now household names, um, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, E.E. E. Cummings, Picasso, Chagall, Matisse. These uh, titans of modernism were virtually unknown uh, before they were introduced on the pages of the dial. I'm going to give a biographical sketch and then Jim is going to talk about Thayer's magazine and his legacy. Okay. Okay, so we'll start at the beginning. Um, there is baby Schofield Thayer with his mother, and you see a picture of his father, Edward Davis Thayer. Schofield was born in Worcester in 1889. He was the only child of Edward Davis Thayer and Florence Schofield Thayer. Now, Edward Thayer is, Thayer's a familiar name in New England, and Edward owned woolen mills throughout New England and was actually involved with Crompton Thayer. Some of you may be familiar with Crompton and Knowles. And they're building down on Green Street, which now houses the Crompton Collective. The, the company was originally Crompton Thayer, but he was incredibly, uh, incredibly wealthy. He held patents for many device, textile related devices. And, um, so that was Thayer's dad. Now Thayer's mother, interestingly enough, had gone to Wellesley College. She was actually in the second class at Wellesley and she graduated in 1877. She was a well-known figure in Worcester. She was a generous philanthropist and, um, and a well-known hostess as well. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, the Thayers were extremely wealthy, and this gives you a sense of some of their homes and yachts. Now, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, 39 Elm Street was their principal residence. The house, unfortunately, no longer stands. The house was built by Jonas Clark, uh, the benefactor and founder of Clark University, and he sold it to a, um, Schofield's father. They also had a home in Newton on Dedham Street. They had a beautiful home on the vineyard in Edgartown, as you see in the right, upper right-hand corner. And um, they also had a yacht. Okay, so Schofield, uh, as I mentioned, um, of course, grew up in Worcester, and he was in the first class at Bancroft School. So he entered in 1900, 
and you see a picture of the school at the time. And Schofield, um, I, I say that here, what you see here actually is a picture of the Bancroft a bulletin um, called The Historian, which was published monthly. And I would say that Schofield actually absolutely got to start not only in Worcester, but at Bancroft School. And what you see here is an essay he wrote um, on Russia when he was just uh, in grammar school. From Bancroft, he went on to Milton Academy and uh, he continued his interest in student publishing. But more interesting was he met uh, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was one of his classmates and they would certainly cross paths as you will hear. Sadly, um, towards the end of his time at uh, Milton, his father died very unexpectedly. He died of uh, complications from an appendectomy. Now, um, Edward Thayer was one of the wealthiest men, not only in New England, but in the country. And Schofield inherited two thirds of his state, his estate, which made him uh, one of the wealthiest people in the US as well. But just shy of 18, he became not only spectacularly wealthy, but independently wealthy. The, mother, the money was left to him so he could do with it as he wanted. <clears throat> So off to Harvard he went, he followed in his father's footsteps. He was a class of 1913. And if you see here, he, he roomed at Westmoreley Court at Harvard, uh, which was considered a Gold Coast dorm. These were the dorms, these luxurious private dorms that had central heating, hot water, indoor plumbing and electricity, which were lacking in the typical um, standard Harvard Yard dorms, so he enjoyed himself there. Um, he wrote, he continued to write, he was involved with the Harvard Monthly. And at, through the Harvard Monthly and at Harvard, he made a lot of friends who he would later go back to as uh, contributors for the dial. Now one person who became a lifelong friend who was mentioned was E.E. E. Cummings. Now, E. Cummings was a few years younger than Thayer, but he, they met because he wrote, he, sorry, meaning um, E. E., he was actually called Estlin. Estlin wrote Thayer a very formal note praising one of his poems. It's a very fawning, flattering letter. And Thayer responded to the praise, certainly, and invited Cummings to join the staff. Mm -hmm. And this odd friendship developed between the very urbane and sophisticated Thayer and the very earthy Cummings. Okay, so from Harvard, uh, in four years, actually, uh, Thayer graduated, well, he graduated cum laude, not only with a BA, but also with a master's. And off he went to Oxford. He uh, attended Bodlin College. He was there for two years and he connected with, reconnected with old friends such as T.S. Eliot, met new friends such as Ezra Pound. And again, he's collecting contacts and uh, for people who would be contributors um, you know, for the dial. Now you also see a picture of Vivian Haywood. Well, who is she? Thayer dated Vivian. Um, she was a very volatile femme fatale and he dated her uh, on and off for a year or two and she was madly in love with him. But Thayer was hesitant to commit to her and so she went off and married uh, T.S. Eliot and they had an extremely, extremely stormy relationship. Um, but it was said of her that she destroyed Eliot as a man, but <clears throat> made him a poet. In any case, um, after two years, Thayer returned, left Oxford without a degree, returned home because he was nervous that the U.S. would enter World War II and did not, did not want to be stuck in, um, in England. Now, a brief mention on how Thayer became interested in modernism. When he was in England, he started to read 
some of the modern writers, he started to buy, buy and look at what was considered modern painting. And by modernism here, what we're really talking about Would you is like the What? I'm sorry, Jim, was that you? No. Oh, okay, sorry. I didn't know if you were clarifying something. We're talking about the movement in the arts that started <clears throat> just before World War I. Tradition is rejected in favor of innovation, and there was an attempt to figure out what was going on and how can the art reflect, better reflect modern society. But what was most interesting about this book is the author predicted that realism would, would fall out of fashion and that abstract art would in fact be um, the norm, which, which certainly happened. Okay, so Thayer returns, as I mentioned, um, to the US and he heads right to New York City. Uh, what you see here, the Benedict, he uh, moves into a spacious uh, penthouse apartment in the Benedict, which was the bachelor, bachelor's only luxury building. Um, this is in right off on Washington Square, so right in the heart of Greenwich Village, which at the time was known as a thriving community of writers and artists. He spent a lot of money and a lot of time um, remodeling it. And he furnished it with, with antique red lacquer furniture and oriental rugs. And on his old paper walls, he hung his beloved Aubrey Beardsley collection. While he was also setting up his uh, household, he hired Oni. In the middle here, you see Oni. And Oni was um, from Japan, and he was an intellectual with very progressive leanings. And he hated being a servant. So he was quite known amongst Thayer's friends. He would enter a room, typically he'd enter a room backwards. Okay, so during this period, Schofield becomes engaged to Elaine Orr, and you see Elaine there left. Elaine was going to work for the Miss Bennett School, and he presented her with a $4,000 marquee shaped diamond ring. Today, that would be about $90,000. But he had met Elaine on a ship in the summer of 1912 and was in hot, hot pursuit of her for many years. And we have lots and lots of letters. Um, Ashley Yale to, at the Yale Beinecke love letters that are just extraordinary um, between the two of them. So they were married in June of 1916 and was common at the time. They headed off for a year-long honeymoon, um, which most of which was spent in California. Okay, so they returned to New York. And when they returned to New York, um, what was interesting, I guess you could say this, was that Thayer, it was long usual, Thayer returned to his bachelor's only residence at the Benedict and he set Elaine up in her own residence around the corner, also uh, on Washington Square North. So this is a, an artist's rendering of Elaine's home. Now, he told Elaine that they had to live separately because he had to focus on his writing and needed quiet. But, but in fact, after the year-long honeymoon, he decided that living with another person was just not for him. And he felt that cohabitation diminished sexual attraction. And he had a, an amusing quote about marriage. He said, well, he said, quote, marriage is a profound punishment for love, unquote. So that sort of sums up uh, what Thayer uh, felt about marriage. However, um, they did function as a couple in many ways. They read together, they went to the theater and opera together. Um, she entertained for him, they were occasionally intimate, um, but they did go their own romantic ways. 
So Elaine became, um, as I mentioned, you know, she was a hostess to many of her husband's literary friends. And one, of course, was E. e. Cummings, and, and they soon began an affair. So we had here a little love triangle. We have Elaine in the mi middle, married to Thayer, and uh, <clears throat> they were occasionally together. But you also had uh, Estlin there. And Estlin, um, Elaine, um, carried on for some time. Thayer was perfectly comfortable with it. He approved of the relationship. And uh, Estlin um, was always short of money. And uh, Thayer was, in fact, his big patron. And Thayer sent him a generous check and said, this is for the time, energy, and other things you have expended upon Elaine. And so he was, as I said, very comfortable um, with this affair. Now, the, the friendship between Thayer and Cummings continued. He, Thayer continued to support him. Um, often financially and to uh, purchase his, you know, writing or, or art or, or whatever, it, you know, it happened to be. Now, ultimately, Elaine became pregnant with Cummings' child. As soon as she became pregnant, um, Cummings rejected her and he said he wanted Elaine as a mistress. He wanted to enjoy her as a prostitute. So Thayer actually assumed responsibility for fatherhood and a little girl was born, Nancy Thayer, in December of 1919. Okay, so back to Thayer now. While, while Elaine was having a relationship with Cummings, Thayer was seeing other women. Um, and two are worth mentioning. One is Elise Gregory. Elise Gregory, in many ways was his platonic wife. Um, he, she was his closest friend, his confidante. Um, she herself was an accomplished writer. She was a very prominent suffragette and uh, she ultimately became uh, the, an editor at the Dial. The other important relationship for him at this time was Louise Bryant. Now, some of you might be familiar with her name. She was a, with her, she was a writer and journalist. She's best known for Six Red Months in Russia, which is an eyewitness account of the Russian, Russia Revolution, 1917. And um, there was a film in the 80s called Reds, with um, Diane Keaton plays um, Louise Bryant and Warren Beatty plays uh, her husband, John Reed. In any case, um, Thayer and Bryant had a pretty passionate relationship and uh, we figure it must be pretty important because he kept a picture of a topless Bryant in his personal papers. Um, so it must have, uh, and, and it, Elaine did needle him about it as well. Okay. So other, two other re important relationships to mention. Um, one is um, James Sibley Watson, Jr. James Sibley Watson had gone to Harvard as well. He was a classmate and Thayer had fixed um, up uh, James Sibley Watson with Hildegard LaSalle, who was actually from Whitensville. That name might be familiar to some people. Watson was the heir to the Western Union fortune, and also was very interested in literature and art. And the other person to remember, I mentioned is Randolph Bourne. Bourne was a progressive writer and leading intellectual whom Thayer admired greatly. And when they met, uh, Bourne was working at a magazine called The Dial, and they happened to need financial backing. Hence Thayer's um, first um, touch brush with the dial. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Thank you. Um, Huck and Joe, thanks for inviting us. I appreciate it. And, and thanks to everybody for turning up tonight. Um, Caroline was to have finished the, uh, the life of Schofield Thayer, but hasn't. But she'll be back later to do that, I'm sure. And if not, we'll find a way to get around to it. Um, my... my uh, uh, remit for the night was to um, 
give some background on the magazine itself, which has a history almost as interesting as Thayer's. Um, the magazine had quite a pedigree. Ralph Waldo Emerson started the dial in 1840 to promote the ideas of his fellow transcendentalists. This was during the, uh, the American Romantic period. Bronson Alcott suggested the title, which referred to a sundial. And according to Emerson, he said, we wish it may resemble that instrument in its celebrated happiness, that of measuring no hours but those of sunshine. And his magazine dispensed such cheery transcendentalism for the next four years, after which it was costing him too much and he stopped it. There was an unsuccessful attempt to revive the magazine in 1860 and then a successful one in 1880 when Francis Brown established a dial in Chicago that he said he hoped would be an intelligent guide and agreeable companion to the book lover. It became a, um, a sort of genteel bulwark of intellectual and cult cultural life in the Midwest. The magazine moved to New York City in 1918, and by this time, Schofield Thayer had joined the staff. As Caroline mentioned, it was at the magazine that um, Thayer met Randolph Bourne, whose writings and ideas he greatly admired. Uh, Bourne had suffered a botched forceps birth, and he also had infant spinal tuberculosis. And, and, and these difficulties resulted in him being short, hunched over, facially deformed, and in generally poor health. Um, despite this, he achieved quite a lot. He, um, he won a scholarship to Columbia University and a fellowship to Europe. So back to the dial with Thayer joining him. Um, and, and in fact, buying it in uh, 1919, along with James Sibley Watson, his Harvard classmate and friend. Thayer's original idea for the dial was to include political writing with Bourne as the political editor, but Bourne died in the influenza pandemic of 1918 at the age of 32. At the age of 32, and Thayer, wanting no one else for the job, decided to forego politics and focus on literature, art, reviews, and critical essays. They wanted a magazine that blended the best of modern along with the best of the traditional. In the May issue that first year, he wrote, if a magazine isn't to be simply a waste of good white paper, it ought to print with some regularity, either such work as would otherwise have to wait years for publication or such as would not be acceptable elsewhere. So he's very interested in the, the innovative, the experimental, the avant-garde. But he was also um, determined to balance that with, um, with what he, he saw as the best of the traditional writers and artists. Thayer didn't expect to make money. Indeed, the magazine never made a profit. One year it lost $100,000, which is over 1.4 million in today's dollars. Its circulation never went above 25,000. Still, the magazine paid its contributors well and soon began the most pr prestigious outlet for writers and artists in both Europe and America. Thayer and Watson were an odd couple. Thayer was mercurial, demanding, and passionate. Watson was quiet and retiring by nature and was quite happy to do his work behind the scenes. Our contributor, Colin Powis, described the partnership this way. How quaint it was to see these two working together for the aesthetic enlightenment of the Western world. It was like seeing- Excuse me. Everybody's not muted. There's a lot of noise. I'm sorry? Yeah. Uh, are you following this okay? We are. The people are not muted. There's a lot of outside noise. Right. Oh. If everybody, if everybody could, Huck is trying to keep everybody muted, uh, but I'm not sure what's happening. What's uh, so is that better? could just make sure that you have a red line on the microphone. That would be great. All right, thank you. It's not echoing. 
Okay, I'm back. Let me go through that quote again. Uh, uh, Powis was talking about Thayer and Watson, and he said it, it was so different. He said it was like seeing a proud, self-willed bull calf bison fed on nothing but golden oats, yoked to the plow with a dainty, fetlocked, dapple gray unicorn. As an editor, Thayer was a perfectionist. He implemented strict rules about the magazine's layout. He held post-mortems of each issue, during which the tiniest error would be tracked down to its source. Once, when W.B. Yeats asked to alter a line in his poem, Leader and the Swan, Thayer ordered an entire signature be pulped and reprinted. For Thayer, every issue of the dial was a work of art in itself. Despite their differences, Thayer and Watson shared a passion for promoting young writers, and in 1921 announced the Dial Award, a $2,000 prize. The idea was to give creators time to create. It was intended to, quote, ensure leisure through which at least one artist may serve God or go to the devil according to his own lights. Eight awards were given. Um, if the slide is up, you'll see they are. Sherwood Anderson, T.S. Eliot, Van White Brooks, Marianne Moore, Ian Cummings, William Carlos Williams, Ezra Pound, and Kenneth Burke. One or two names have um, faded somewhat into the background, but the majority of them were, were really the, the highest of the high moderns in, in the 20th century. The highlights of the magazine. Um, even a century later, the list is still pretty impressive. Uh, older, revered writers such as Yeats and Joseph Conrad and George Moore rubbed elbows with the newer talents of E.E. E. Cummings, T.S. Eliot, D.H. Lawrence, Marianne Moore, Ezra Pound, and Virginia Woolf. Seminal works first appeared in the magazine's pages. Eliot's The Wasteland and The Hollow Men, Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, Lawrence's The Prussian Officer, Pound's Hugh Selwyn Moberly, E.E. E. Cummings' Buffalo Bills, and Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. Its foreign correspondents were Eliot, Pound, Mann, and Maxim Gorky. The Dial was at the center of a series of artistic feuds. After Thayer rejected Ernest Hemingway's poems, Hemingway referred to him as Schofield buggering Thayer. Thayer was, uh, despite the slander, undoubtedly heterosexual, but Hemingway was notorious homophobic and tended to apply this label to anyone he didn't particularly like. Albert Barnes, a doctor turned art collector, with a celebrated modernist art collection now in Philadelphia, started out as an ally and wrote a piece for the dial, but turned on Thayer with such vehemence that Thayer, who was then tipping towards serious mental instability, developed a paranoia regarding Barnes, and after a particularly disturbing confrontation, even bought a pistol to protect himself. Thayer developed close relationships with many of his artists and many created portraits of him. Here are a few. It has to be said that the magazine that Thayer and Watson displayed just a, 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 a tremendous aesthetic variety uh, uh, dealing with art, literature, the theater, vaudeville, cinema, and even prize fighting. After Thayer's breakdown and resignation from the dial in 1926, Marianne Moore became editor and Watson, a medical doctor with many interests, started pursuing other activities such as avant-garde film. He produced several expressionist films, including Lot in Sodom, and the first film version of Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. The last issue of The Dial was published in July 1929. Without Thayer at the helm, the magazine had lost some of its edge, but its goals, including the promotion of young modern artists and writers, had been realized. When the magazine folded, modernism had become mainstream. The Dial published many writers before they went on to receive national and public recognition. Um, those who wrote for the magazine uh, included 11 Nobel Prize winners and 24 Pulitzers. After Thayer was declared 
an insane person, this would be in the 1930s at this point, insane person was a legal term at the time. His mother, as his guardian, placed most of his art collection on loan at the Worcester Art Museum, as Caroline mentioned, where it resided so long, half a century, that many people assumed it would be bequeathed to the museum upon Thayer's death. Of course, it wasn't. The will left the 400 plus works to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The will also stipulated that the art there had to be on permanent display and a probate court hearing was held to define the meaning of the phrase. Lawyers for the Met argued successfully that since works on paper comprised much of the collection, hanging them permanently would cause irreversible damage. So the collection was packed up and shipped off to the Met, where it has been since 1984. Many people have wondered why Thayer chose not to leave his collection to his hometown, or at least part of it. We can only speculate, but there is the story about a famous portrait painter, John Christen Johansson, who visited Worcester in 1924 to paint the portrait of the president of Clark University. The Worcester Telegram dispatched a reporter to write a story about the artist, and during the interview, the matter of modern art and the dial came up. The dial, said Johansson, is an intellectual sewer. Johansson may have thought that he was safe making such a remark in a provincial New England town, but of course Thayer's family still lived here and Thayer was quickly made aware of the insult. Johansson tried desperately to backpedal and apologize, but to no avail. And Thayer wrote an editorial for the dial that excoriated Johnson, his ideas on art, Clark University and Worcester whose cultural outlook he compared to an Alpine village. Also, during the March 1924 exhibit of Thayer's collection at the Worcester Art Museum that Caroline mentioned, um, <clears throat> to Thayer's irritation, a large brack oil painting and a, a nude woman, of a nude woman and a Pablo Picasso drawing were pulled for fear of offending the conservative. The following year, he drew up his will leaving nothing to Worcester. In addition to his art collection, Thayer left an equally rich trove of letters and manuscripts, which offered a unique series of epistolary interactions among the editors of the dial and the writers and artists it featured. It was thanks to collections such as this that scholars eventually began to understand the crucially important part that magazines like the dial played in the growth and dissemination of modernist ideas and movements between Europe and the United States. A second batch of dial papers was found in a trunk in a Worcester storage company that was labeled as holding household effects. In fact, it held volumes of letters written by Thayer Watson and Ezra Pound. All of these papers are now at Yale's Beinecke Library. That trunk in storage, by the way, which had lain unopened for 50 years, also contained Thayer's collection of erotica, including the notorious Picasso painting, Erotic Scene, now also at the Met. The only thing left of Thayer in Worcester is his gravestone in rural cemetery. Thayer's life was filled with both tragedy and accomplishment. The dial is a singular achievement in the history of magazine publishing and helped define and create the artistic and literary of 20th century Western culture. Thayer's impact was tremendous. For years, he was forgotten and virtually unknown. That's slowly changing. The, the biography had the aim of bringing Thayer back into public view and showcasing his achievements. In 2018, the Metropolitan Museum of Art mounted an exhibit of work by Picasso, Klimt and Sheila from Thayer's art collection. And a film documentary is in production, a piece of which we hope to see at some point this evening. Thayer appears to be finally getting the recognition he deserves. Now that's the end of my presentation. So if Caroline is uh, up and running, we can move along to hers.
Okay, so we'll, should I pick up Joe? Would that be? I, I think so. Where it think? Freud, I think is That's where Freud. you left off. Yeah. <laughs> and well, thank you everybody for staying muted. <laughs> so, um, I, if, if everyone can see, I'm just going to pick up a little bit. So basically I was talking about um, Thayer starting to experience mental distress and he, he starts buying books by Sigmund Freud and one book in particular that uh, you can see here heavily annotated um, pages of this book. Now this is Introductory Lectures on Psychoanalysis by Sigmund Freud and I pull this out because um, because this book basically is a collection of lectures that Freud gave um, in Worcester in 1909. And you see in the photograph, the gentleman in the middle sitting is Dr. G. Stanley Hall. He was hired by Jonas Clark as the first president of Clark University. He was fascinated by psychology, which was just developing at the time. And to celebrate the school's 20th anniversary, he invited all these prominent psychiatrists, among them Freud. So there is Freud um, and his only trip to the US um, sitting there. Freud is uh, next to G. Stanley Hall. Now you also see in the lower right hand corner, um, there's a statue of course of Freud at Clark. And I thought this was just a fun picture to show uh, he was appropriately masked, a sign of the times. Okay, so <clears throat> what happened next was um, Freud accepted um, Thayer as a patient and off Thayer goes to Vienna. He would spend two years in Vienna and he did, he did not get the help he wanted um, from Freud. Freud, remember, was uh, his area of expertise was neurosis and um, Thayer probably was dealing with psychosis. He exhibited uh, symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, which Freud was not equipped to handle. But while he was there, Freud, this was one of the most productive periods of Thayer's life, and he made the most of his time there. He uh, was part of the intellectual life of Vienna. He interacted with writers and purchased a lot of art. In fact, the bulk of the collection that Jim mentioned was purchased while he was based in Vienna. Okay, another, another major accomplishment while in Vienna was this book called Living Art. Now, these books are extremely hard to find. These, the Worcester Art Museum has a copy and Jim Wallou told me a, a very interesting story that when Jim was head of the art museum, they would get calls because the quality of the reproductions in this book that they wrote are of such high quality, people think that they are the real thing. Uh, what they are trying to do was present what he thought was the most interesting in contemporary art. When he came back to the US after being in Vienna, he had great plans to heavily promote this book. And his idea was to do a book tour, but to bring the art along with it. So he did his best um, to generate interest in the art, but alas, uh, no one, very few uh, places were interested in showing the art. In fact, there were only three. One was the Montrose Gallery in New York, and there was a big uh, customer there, so that's obvious. The second was Smith College, and the third was the Worcester Art Museum. And uh, so it, it makes sense here to remind people that the Art Museum uh, was considered, was very cutting edge in terms of modern art, showing and exhibiting modern art, and also acquiring the Art Museum was one of the first to show photography, to acquire works by Monet, Redon, and Gauguin. So it was a very apt men, uh, venue for this collection. 
However, Thayer's decline accelerated, and by 1926, he had resigned from the magazine. Uh, Marianne Moore, as Jim mentioned, uh, took his place. And after that, he occasionally um, would submit poetry. He made uh, decisions about um, the Dial Award, but uh, for all intents and purposes, he was, um, uh, he just wasn't as actively involved. He couldn't be. Now, I, I take a moment here um, to, to a comment that Aristotle famously said that there's no great genius without some touch of madness. And this idea that there is a link between creative genius and madness is something certainly we've heard about, read about, it's not new. Um, well, obviously mental illness is not necessarily, not necessary for creativity to flourish. History shows that there are many famous people in the arts with mental illness. And we, we just did a, a little sampling of uh, some of the hundreds of writers and artists in the dial. And a random sample of um, shows that um, during, well, probably well over a third suffered from mental illness. And I, I bring this up because um, one has to remember that you're looking at the names of people, many of whom were unknown at the time. They became giants. And um, this, this mental illness that uh, the studies show that there's a correlation between, again, uh, mental illness and creativity. And it's been suggested that those with mental illness see the world in a unique way. And uh, that could be true. And, you know, certainly Thayer did because he was able to choose to, to select um, so effectively um, these writers and artists who have certainly stood the, stood the test of time. Uh, by 1937, Thayer was declared legally insane, and for the next 45 years or so, he lived a very secluded life, surrounded by caretakers and guardians, primarily on the vineyard, but he would uh, travel to a home he had in Florida as well. He continued to write in English, French, and German, but was often incoherent. He was an avid sailor and sailed until he was in his late 70s. He was always very fit, in good shape. Um, he finally died in 1982. He was 92, and he died at his home at uh, Longtree Cottage in Edgartown. Um, and and I, I'm gonna quickly go back to the art uh, that Jim mentioned, because I think that um, you know, the art, as we've mentioned, had been at the Worcester Art Museum for decades. And here, just to, uh, some of you, I'm sure, remember seeing uh, the collection. But just to remind, these are some of the, the highlights. So, you, you know, Matisse, you see Matisse, Lachaise, Picasso, Sheila, Kakashka. Bonard, Lautrec, Matisse, the scream in the middle. Um, it, gives you, it gives you a sense of Thayer's taste. Um, Chagall, Nadelman, Marie Lorenzen, Brock. It, in the upper right-hand corner, the nude, the Brock nude. This was the painting that Jim referenced that um, the museum took out of the 1924 exhibition. Um, so just one, one more thing I want to add uh, is that, um, uh, again, I want to stress that uh, Thayer had an incredible eye for talent. And I, what is amazing to me is, again, what he was buying were virtual unknowns. And yet, here we are, uh, 100 years later, and these are the, these are the artists that we consider important. Um, a majority of the artists that they are purchased or featured in the dial are all at the Museum of Modern Art. And MoMA is certainly one of the most important cultural institutions for 
for for modern art. So I think we really have to salute Thayer's taste and and prescience uh, in terms of the art and and writers writing he selected. Okay, so I think we're happy to take questions. And I'm sorry, I have to apologize for the bad, you know, the technical <laughs> difficulties as we are out of state. There's been a lot going on this uh, in our say so no need to apologize, Caroline. <laughs> um, so Ingrid, are you um I am here, but I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Oh, okay. That's because I because Jim and and, uh, and Caroline did such a great job. I know. I think that really it was really really fabulous. Oh wait, here we have one. Okay. Yay. Um, this is from Haley, Holly Allen. Holly. Holly. I'm sorry. It says H A L L E Y. Oh. Anyway, was the dial the impetus? for other magazines. Who would like to answer that? Jim? Jim, why don't you start? Jim, you're on. Jim, you're on mute. <laughs> Just when we were trying to get everybody on mute. <laughs> I know. Or Caroline, do you want to jump in on that? Well, I, I can start and I'll let Jim um, finish. And Holly, that's a great question. Um, during the 20s, there were so many magazines and, and the, the, the magazines, in fact, there were so many um, that this, it was known as the era of the little magazine. And little magazine meant that uh, a magazine that was, had a relatively small circulation and that had a very particular focus. And the dial... Um, has always been very hard to classify because on the one hand, it was a little magazine, but it, it's certainly one of the largest of the little magazines. I mean, some of these would have circulations of 1,000 or 500, even less than that. But it definitely inspired other magazines. It was copied um, by many magazines in terms of the art that was in there, in terms of the writers that were presented. So, um, yes, and, and I'll also add, too, that um, the, aisle, the dial had such an impact that um, it really became the impetus for the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA. And, and as Jim mentioned, when the dial shuttered in 1929, um, you know, it, it had done its job. Modern art and writing had, you know, were now part of the mainstream and MoMA opened. And that's extremely important to mention because there had not been an institution of that sort that was showing, uh, showing modern art. Jim. Very good, yeah, that. absolutely. Uh, I was wondering about the the uh, interesting story about the litigation that went on when he died. Bob Whipple, who was a lawyer in the firm that handled Schofield Thayer's affairs, gave a talk at the Fireside many years ago, which was so good and so long that that at the end of the allotted time, he asked if he could have a, another session at it. We all agreed we could. Huh. That paper, I'm sure, is at the Antiquarian Society. And it gives some inside stuff about the legal niceties and exigencies that went on. It's, it's a yeah, I do have a copy of that. The administration yeah. of the estate of Schofield Thayer. So if you want a copy, I'd be happy to share it with you. <laughs> no, no, thanks. <laughs> uh, it was there. <laughs> you were probably there, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump in here with another question from Tony Armstrong. Okay. It says, besides Barnes, were there other private art collectors that Thayer worked with, either positively or clashed with them, as he did with Barnes? Not as far as I know. I mean, I mean the, 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 there was always rivalry among the art collectors because everybody wanted the good stuff at the cheapest price. Um, but it, it was a really one-off situation with Barnes. Barnes was... Barnes was a bully. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, you know, he grew up on the, on the tough side of town and he boxed as a young man. And even though he became an MD and all the rest of it, he, he always kept that, 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 that roughness to him. And I think with, um, with uh, Thea's paranoia, this, this, this blew up in his mind and Barnes became a kind of bete noir that, that, that he just couldn't shake. But no others as far as I know. Oh, he did have a, a, little, a little fight on the pages of the dial with Leo Stein, who was Gertrude Stein's brother and, a, and an art collector. Okay. But that, that fizzled out. Thank you, Jim. I'm looking here. There's a from Karen Christensen to Caroline. I'd love to know if Caroline has had any success in finding video film footage from the dial period. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and the answer is no. Karen, hi, how are you? I, I wish I could say yes, um, and we have not. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're, we're employing a type of animation in the film where you're basically uh, taking still photography and making them come to life because we have been completely unsuccessful um, finding. In fact, <clears throat> we've only been able to find one or two or three photographs of uh, the dial. I mean, in, in other words, the dial offices. So, so uh, sadly, the answer is no. Mm. But if you find anything, let me know. Brian, one of those was the photograph that I have taken in the dial, that was taken in the dial offices. Well, I think, right now, are you talking about the Mumford because, photo? Because, because Watson took a photo of Sophia Wittenberg in that, that's actually in the dial. And yeah. And there's a photo of Lewis Mumford that was taken in the dial offices. I mean, there's, the background doesn't really tell you anything. I mean, they're no. not. No. They're lovely photos, but um, not at all what you were looking for. No, no. It gives a sense. Actually, Marianne Moore, um, who was certainly an interesting character, um, her and, and ultimately became editor of The Dial, she had an incredible correspondence with her uh, brothers and would describe down to the last detail um, what happened in her day. And it is thanks to her that we have a pretty detailed description of what the offices looked like. In other words, oh. We, oh, there, yeah. were, there yep. were always, you know, it was a townhouse as everybody saw. And there were fireplaces in each room um, and Thayer ensured that there were fresh flowers um, on the fireplaces, uh, you know, they, they were put every other day or whatever it was. Um, so, but it's thanks to Mary and Moore, we have the descriptions, we just don't have the visuals. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a question from Liz Apgar. What happened to Nancy? <laughs> oh, golly. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> well, she grew up believing that Schofield Thayer was her father. Uh, her mother, by this, her, mo her mother married E.E. E. Cummings, divorced him three months later, and then met and married a an Irish merchant banker and settled in uh, in the UK. Uh, Nancy was brought up there, believing that Schofield was her father, and was curious about it, but. At first she was told that the father was dead and then she was told that the father had a mental breakdown and couldn't see anybody. Um, and the strange thing was, it, 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 it finally came out that she met Cummings in New Hampshire, not knowing that he was her father. And she started visiting him and he started painting her, using her as a model. And uh, at one point she said something that made it sort of obvious that she had something of a crush on him. And it was at that moment that Cummings said, you do know I'm your father, don't you? And she hadn't known that at all. She was a, she was a young mother herself at the time. 
she married, um, Nancy married uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, grandson, uh, Willard Roosevelt, and they had met in Washington. And uh, so they, they married, had a couple of children. Then Nancy actually married um, once or twice more. I can't remember now. Once or twice more. And well, yeah. She lived in Athens, uh, Greece, for a while. She she married a a, a British writer, and um, but uh, I spoke to her daughter at one point, and her daughter said her whole life was focused on trying to resolve her feelings about her father Cummings, E. e. Cummings, and she never quite got over the sense of betrayal that she you know, didn't know uh, who he was. Um, interestingly, when Thayer and Elaine divorced, of course, it was a, it was a very amicable uh, divorce, and Thayer set up a very large trust fund for Nancy. So he was very generous, and in his letters, uh, he and Elaine, despite their divorce, again, as I mentioned, it was a friendly divorce, they corresponded for years, but in the, um, he was always sending Nancy presents and uh, asking how she was doing. So there was definitely affection uh, between Thayer and Nancy, but she, he only knew her in, in the very early years of her life because then Elaine moved abroad, as Jim mentioned. Okay, thank you. I think there's one more question here from Holly Allen. I got her name right this time. Um, the women Thayer was involved with sound like exceptional women of the time. Any more about them? Well, you know what, Janice Gregory, are you still on? Janice? Yes, I just had to unmute myself. Hi okay. there. It's so great to see the two of you. And well, it's great to see you. I want to. I want to introduce everybody. This is uh, Janice Gregory. is is a writer um, a, from a long family tradition and a historian. And her, the Elise Gregory that I flashed on the screen, Thayer's dearest friend and confidant, uh, was Janice's great aunt. Wait, great. Yes, that's right. That's great. right. One great aunt. One great. <laughs> One great. But Janice, if you would um, say a few words about her, she she was just she was recently in England at a a, a, con a conference and spoke about um, spoke about uh, her um, about Elise. So anyway, maybe you could get it from the horses oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I said, you know, when you know so much about somebody, it's hard to do sort of a thumbnail sketch of it uh, without going on and on. Um, I Let me go back. Uh, it was um, Randolph Bourne who introduced Thayer and um, Elise. And they became, Elise had a little coffee shop. She was not really very, she was a writer and she was trying to, um, to uh, make her way as a, a writer by running this coffee shop that was right next to the dial. And so all the dial artists and um, writers would come down, including Thayer, um, to uh, review manuscripts and to talk. And, and Elise also had fireside salons. And um, it, it amazes me that Thayer really saw in Elise um, her talents. And I think she had two talents. One was the um, one was she was a very good writer, but the other thing was she had great interpersonal skills. So during uh, the the time before uh, Marianne Moore took over, I think she played a role of um, of really uh, keeping the dial on track and helping manage. Um, Thayer's mercurial, <laughs> I guess you could call it that, um, yes. his personality, which was, which was quite um, challenging, I'm sure, in terms of uh, you described uh, one of the editorial meetings. But then she left in, in 25 and went off to marry. Uh, you used a quote from Poe's, I don't know if that was Llewellyn, I think it was Llewellyn, often had her own 
amazingly dramatic and um, interesting life. They all had these these lives that are just so filled with um, drama and um, and really pushing the the boundaries of modernism in in more than just art um, and and literature, but also in their lifestyles, because they were like Elise was married, but she never took her husband's name and she was into free love and you know and all these things the triangles that were going on i don't know i always thought of that time as much more um not quite as uh i don't know how to say it <laughs> as liberal as it turns out to have been but anyway so that's uh if there's anything else i'd be glad to say but thank you, for the and, and, I, thank you. and janice i think also um it's, you know, you make a very good point. I don't want to get too, too in the weeds here, but when you read letters, um, Elise Gregory, she write these charming little notes, you know, like to, to Yates, for example. And, you know, Mr. Thayer's asked me, you know, we haven't had a poem for you from a long time and the readers would love to, to have one. Would you consider sending us something else? Um, and she she did a lot of encouraging for young writers yeah, um, and artists. When you read the Marianne Moore correspondence, uh, her letters are extremely different. Uh, there was one rejection letter. Well, maybe you should reconsider uh, being a writer. I mean, <laughs> a completely different you know approach. Um, and it's I wish that she had been at the dial longer and hadn't moved to England because I think uh, the, the end of the story may have been different. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, have, I have wondered that, but I think the dial with, um, you know, with Thayer's mental illness, um, it, it at least really left a very propitious time because I, I, I it, you know, much much of the modern um, literature, maybe there was more to discover, but a lot of it had, um, it had already been presented in the dial, the, the literature and the art. And even the New Republic, I, I recall reading something where they were saying, well, the dial, you know, they've lost their edge. I don't know how long you can keep that kind of edge because there are only so many stars probably, I, you know, it's up to conjecture at that at one time. So anyway. Well, you know, but it's interesting, Jim, you mentioned Finnegan's Wake, and I mean, I think that's a good example. I mean, Moore was too prudish um, to likely to, to accept that for publication, and so they missed, on, you know, they missed out on a great literary scoop. Yeah, and Schofield would never be that prudish. I mean, he would have. No. Right? He'd like to push the boundaries, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, part of what uh, holds the fascination is how brightly the flame burnt and then quickly went out, right? I mean, that's sort of what, you, it's always this question of, well, what might have been, right? Right. Like, no, exactly. No, well, I, have, I do have a question for you now that I'm on. Um, uh, when will your film be coming out, do you think? And how are you going to release it so that people can, um, can see it? Um, well, you know, I wish I could answer that. We, we were set for um, a series of final shoots in March and alas, <laughs> COVID intervened. Right, right. So we are extremely behind and I, I just don't know. A, a lot yeah. will depend on what the, what the rules are about shooting, access, et cetera. And um, there are a lot of people involved in the, this sort of double series of shoot that we needed, and I don't know when we'll be able to do it. So we're, we're at a standstill. You know, I thought of you, really, I thought of you right when the COVID, I thought, oh no, how could this be? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll come out at the right time, right? Yes, it'll yes come out. I hope so, I hope yeah. so. All right, Holly, did we answer your question? A little more than she wanted. <laughs> no, absolutely. The, I, I, Fascinating, really, really interesting about a person I knew nothing about. And, and I actually really enjoyed the fact that the tech issues took us to Jim and because we kind of got the whole big picture and then went back to you, Caroline, 
So for me, that was a really good interruption. <laughs> oh, good. We, did that, we did that on purpose. That yeah. was all on purpose, Holly. I know. Uh, Joe, you're so seamless when it comes to technology. I know. <laughs> well, do you anyway, think this, um, yes, yes, you did. Thank you. Do you think this might be a good time to try to do the um, trailer? Joe? Hot, are you there? I can try once more. Okay. <laughs> There are no more questions that have come up, so. All right. We may have some questions for Hawk after we see his private email. Yeah. <laughs> oh. so can, we get, can we buy the book this weekend, you said? Or? So um, I think so. So All the right. shipment, <laughs> uh, it should be coming in to us. We ordered. Um, ordered the books um, a week ago or so, and they haven't arrived yet. So what I'll do is let everybody know, and um, um, when they when they arrive, and if you'd like to buy one, excellent. Or two or three, yeah. Or two or three, absolutely. And see, I think it's great because you can read the book while you wait for the film to come out. So it's perfect. Absolutely. And can I and also. And Joe, I was just going to say, Jim offered also remember to do some signing. Yes, that's right. So that absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Would you like to say something about the book, which I okay. think is yes. absolutely fabulous, um, because it's it's an amazing um, uh, that he put, put so much into a really readable book, um, and it's I've gone back to it again and again uh, for references and to see what's going on, and um, it's really both a wonderful read and also very um, interesting historically, so. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. Yeah. Excellent. So, Huck, what do you think? How is it All coming? Right, well, we'll, we'll give it a try. All right. <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. In 1920, one man in a stroke of genius made America modern. To a provincial people, he brought Picasso, Matisse, Chagall. To an insular nation, he introduced Eliot. He who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Pound. For three years out of key with his time, he strove to resuscitate the dead art of poetry. E. e. Cummings. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Armed only with his small magazine, The Dial. He set the cultural agenda for a generation. On a site long occupied by the Rockefeller family, stands the new fashion home of a nationally important institution, the New York Museum of Modern Art. The most brilliant editor of his generation, he published nine Nobel and 23 Pulitzer Prize winning authors, amassed a fortune in modern art, was loved by Marianne Moore, slandered by Ernest Hemingway, psychoanalyzed by Sigmund Freud, and went slowly insane. But for a time, for a moment, with a stroke of genius, Schofield Thayer was the man who made America modern. You know, we had actually, yeah, that's a thank you, Hawk. We had, we had actually um, wondered wh whether we should show it at the beginning or show it at the end. And actually, I think, you know, as Holly was saying, sometimes technology works in our favor. I think it was great to see it at the end because I it just. I don't understand what happened. While yeah. I'm reading <laughs> my email, I was seeing the film. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw it this time. But I um, want to thank Ingrid. Thank you for, for uh, fielding all the questions and whatnot. And, uh, and uh, Caroline and Jim, uh, what a 
totally fascinating um, presentation. And uh, it was so, I thank you for, for managing throughout all the, the technology issues and things like that. But it was absolutely, absolutely fabulous and great questions, everybody. And so I, you know, applaud you and thank you very, very much. So I also want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. We do have a, a, some other Zoom events in case you're interested. We're on July 2nd, writer Tom Dresser is, uh, he's going to be with us um, uh, uh, talking about his uh, new book on tourism in Martha's Vineyard. So that can remind us all of Schofield Fair also, of course, with Edgar Town. So that's great. And then another with Seth R Richardson from the University of Chicago, which will actually run for about four weeks, but I promise you won't have to stay on Zoom for four weeks. Um, it's, um, it's, 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 it's through a series of of, of videos, uh, Seth will guide us through a reading of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And uh, so it'll culmin culminate in a discussion in Q&A Zoom in either late July or early August, whenever whenever we get to that. But, uh, but that's kind of exciting. So we have a few other events in the planning stages as well, and we'll, we'll keep, you, uh, keep you informed. But in the meantime, really, thank you so, so much for coming, and thank you Jim and Caroline um, for You're doing welcome. it. You guys can all unmute yourself now and we can all just clap. Yay. <laughs> but it was wonderful. Thank you so much.